All right, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm really happy to be here. We have some really interesting discussions the last couple of days. So yeah, thanks for inviting me. Um, <clears throat> this is a new idea that we've been working on uh, recently. It's a little bit different than uh, most of the other things that we've had in this uh, workshop. Um, <clears throat> it's uh, the work has mostly been done by Nick, who's the first name uh, below. Um, and it's probably going to be part of his uh, PhD project. Um, it's still kind of work in progress, which is why I've put in this like WIP tag in the title. <clears throat> um, yeah, it's a pretty simple idea, but uh, yeah, we think it might be uh, applicable to a lot of the things that, um, that we've otherwise talked about. Okay, so the first thing is uh, motivating the idea. Uh, why do we need this? Then I'm going to go over the, the theory of what we're doing. Then I'm going to show some results and then discuss uh, what, we're, what we want to do with it. Um, and what are some open questions? Um, so yeah, first motivating. Um, it's a little bit of a joke, but I think it's also uh, true. All models are wrong, but some models are more wrong than others. It's a hybrid quote by George Cox and George Orwell, and just put up this windsock here because that's like my favorite example of like a minimal inverse problem. Like you can observe it and it shows you where the wind is coming from. So I think that's quite nice. Um, so, okay. Um, the first context here is multi-level Monte Carlo, where you have a, some levels of a model with maybe different discretizations or however you've constructed these levels. You draw some samples from a distribution and then you uh, pass uh, successively fewer samples up to the next levels. So the question here is which samples to pick? And if you can pick only very few samples and maybe the distribution is a bit complicated, then uh, just doing simple random sampling um, of the lower levels may actually introduce some bias. And uh, I'm gonna show an example of that, how that might look like later. Um, so in order to get like most out of the samples that you pass up to these um, potentially very expensive models that are on higher levels, then we're looking for some kind of optimal empirical approximation of the parameter distribution, empirical in the sense that there are samples from the distribution. Um, <clears throat> so that would be the context for multi-level Monte Carlo. There's another um, idea here uh, for multi-fidelity models where maybe you have some kind of simple uh, material model uh, where you have a prior distribution of the parameters uh, here. Can you see my cursor, by the way? You can see it. Okay, some prior distribution of parameters here and some observations, maybe from like a, a laboratory experiment on this materials. And we can build some posterior distributions of these uh, of the stress um, from from some deformation, um, and it's a relatively cheap model, so we can uh, run multi level uh, or we can run some Monte Carlo uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo on this uh, model relatively cheaply. Then we get a posterior distribution, <clears throat> but our final objective is to run it through a very expensive. Um, material model on a mesh. Um, and maybe we only have the computational budget for a few samples. So then the question is again, how to choose exactly um, which samples to feed forward into this, uh, uh, <clears throat> this uh, high level model. Um, and it becomes sort of like a optimal design problem, how to choose the design points so that uh, we best represent the posterior distribution that we obtain from, from our low fidelity model. Um, so that means again, we need to compress 
uh, the, the output from the Monte Carlo, from the Markov chain Monte Carlo uh, sampler. Uh, so there has been a little bit of research on this idea of thinning um, already. Some of you might be familiar with this uh, paper on Stein thing thinning that they call optimal thinning of MCMC output, I think. Um, and here's the kernel that they use to uh, compute the discrepancy between their um, the thin sample and the full uh, set of samples. And it's a little bit of a mouthful, but um, if you see here and here and here, you actually need the gradient of the posterior distribution. And as you know, uh, this is not always uh, simple and it can be expensive, um, <clears throat> especially in the context of these PDE constraint problems that, uh, that we are often looking at. Uh, additionally, if you want to compute this, uh, all of these, uh, the kernel of all of the samples, then you can end up with a very large kernel matrix um so because yeah you often have loads of mcmc samples so our objective here was to develop a simple uh, fast and gradient free approach for thinning of mcmc output okay so we move on to daft theory um <clears throat> so the first thing we need here is a measure of distance between our empirical distributions. That's a measure of distance between the entire uh, sampling history uh, of our MCMC samples um, and the subsample that we're going to pass on to a more expensive model. So that's uh, typically defined by a feature map uh, like this. Um, C. No, this is phi. Uh, from uh, the sample space to uh, calligraphic H here, where H is a uh, um, reproducing curling kernel Hilbert space. And then it's just the norm here between the differences of the expectation of the samples uh, projected with this feature map. Um, and the question then uh, that then comes up, which uh, functions to choose uh, as phi? Um, and that's where this kernel trick uh, comes in and we can represent where we can represent the inner product between uh, uh, these uh, functions as a kernel. And that just expands to this. This is all, all pretty standard. Um, <clears throat> but then we're again back to this problem with the kernel um, that, that can be costly if we have to evaluate that between every single um, sample in our MCMT chain and, and memory intensive. So, <clears throat> so what we do is we borrow some ideas from machine learning, and this is a pretty widely used approach where you um, where you uh, take your data, that means the, the actual MCMC samples, and put them through a random feature map that approximates the kernel. And then we get just this uh, Euclidean inner product uh, between these random feature maps. And in this paper, they show that um, a number of different shift invariant can kernels can be approximated by exactly this, um, which is, they call it a, um, a random Fourier expansion or random Fourier features because it's cosines, right? Um, and for example, if you want uh, to approximate a Gaussian kernel, then you can draw uh, these uh, omegas from a normal distribution and B from a uniform distribution. Um, and they also show that when D goes to infinity, that means the, uh, the dimension of this random feature map, then the, uh, then the approximation goes to the kernel. Uh, yeah, in the limit. So, okay, so we can put all this together, our definition of the MMD and this uh, random feature map, and we get this uh, mean 
of, of the two uh, projections. So the first term here, oh, oh, sorry. So the first term here is all the samples. Uh, <clears throat> and we only need to compute that once, right? And it's, it, it's relatively cheap um, because it's just a, um, oh, what did I do now? Okay, it's relatively cheap because it's just uh, an, an inner product. And then for this one, we need to evaluate uh, for all our candidate uh, subsamples. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, that's it. Uh, that's our approximate MMD. And then we had another idea that if we could assign weights at the same time as we uh, pick the samples, then we could get a weighted MMD. Um, and that would allow us to take basically fewer samples from um, high density areas of the, of the posterior and get more samples from uh, the tails without um, like reducing its kind of representative power, uh, this uh, subset of samples. Okay, so we have this fast MMD approximation um, between two empirical samples. Now the problem is, uh, is minimizing it, right? Uh, picking the right samples that will minimize this estimator. And, and this is problematic because it's a discrete optimization problem with many, many uh, options. It's, we, we, we can't compute all of the different possibilities. So we need some kind of clever uh, approach to do this. There's also probably many near optimal solutions that are, have almost the same MMD because of autocorrelation between the samples and so on and so on. So um, the, the previous studies of, um, of this uh, thinning problem have used some um, kind of slicing of the of the samples to try and reduce the number of different um, kind of uh, possibilities. Uh, but we've gone with uh, trying to use a genetic algorithm instead, because that means that we can do it everything in kind of one shot. And it's really simple to set up. Um, plus, we'll get a population of solutions. And that might be useful, for example, in a multi-index setting where you don't want to pass the same subset uh, along different axes. Uh, so the genetic algorithm is a little bit of a hot potato. Some people love it and some people hate it. Um, people tend to not like it because it's hard to prove uh, that it converges. So there's not much kind of like rigorous uh, theory uh, underpinning it, but it works really well, especially for these types of problems uh, with uh, like a discrete, um, a discrete parameter space and many uh, near optimal solutions. Okay, so the way it works is that you set up a population of candidates. So this calligraphic Y would be a bunch of um, subsets that we would just choose randomly. Then we can compute the fitness of those. That's just the, um, the way you express um, like, what's it called? Optimality in a genetic algorithm. So we want to minimize the MD. So we want to maximize the inverse of the MMD. Um, and then the way you do it is that you preserve the best, um, the best chromosomes. That means the best subset of samples across generations. And, and then you mutate the rest. Uh, so you swap uh, samples between the different individuals in this population, and you try to bring in new samples um, at each step to see how that uh, affects the, the fitness function. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I've just put up a little illustration of how the different like mechanics of uh, the genetic algorithm works, mating, uh, the top one, you pick two uh, individuals with a, with a high fitness and you swap um, 
some numbers between them, some indexes between them, and you get a, a new and hope that this might be better. And mutation, you just take one of the samples and, uh, and mutate some of the numbers, just bring in new samples from, from your whole um, MCMC sampling history. Okay, <clears throat> so that's uh, the MMD and how we minimize it. So here's uh, a, some numerical evidence that this works. We drew some samples from a banana distribution, um, a large sample and a smaller sample. And then here you can see how this approximate MND converges. Um, you can see this, uh, the lift uh, here, the, the lift uh, figure here is just the right, but zoomed in. And what you can see is in the beginning with not that many features, uh, not that high feature space dimension, then there's some oscillations, which is kind of what we expected. Um, but then as we add more and more features, they all converge towards the same, um, same MMD. <clears throat> yeah, and this is, I should say, this is 10 different uh, random feature spaces. And here we have the angry man distribution uh, or Timomenos. It sounds a little bit more professional in Greek, um, where the blue samples is a lot of samples from, uh, from these disjoint uh, multimodal distributions. Um, <clears throat> and as you can see, I don't know if you can see, but the red dots here, they are just uh, simple random samples. And because we choose so few, they completely miss out on the eyes out here. There's no samples from up here. Uh, while the daft samples, uh, they look pretty much how you would expect them to be. There's some, there's a sample from each mode of these multimodal distributions and uh, with some, um, and there's one here and one here that kind of approximates this, uh, this tail here. Uh, I should also say that the size actually of the daft samples, that's the weight because in this one, we use the weighted version because with genetic algorithm, we can just also approximate the weights uh, at the same time as we, uh, as we find the, the best samples. Um, there's one thing up here, you can see that this sample doesn't get assigned the correct weight, but assigning weights and choosing samples at the same time is just very, very ill posed. Um, so that's something that we're working on uh, still figure out how we can make this more robust. Um, but it gets it surprisingly right, considering how, how difficult uh, this, uh, this problem is. All right, <clears throat> so the reason we've started to look into this is because we want to use it on like a real problem. And this links back to what I showed earlier with this multi-fidelity model, where we have a way to estimate these material parameters from some laboratory experiments, but we actually want those material parameters um, to, to estimate some quantity of uh, interest on this, um, on this bridge for example, maximum stress or displacement, um, but it's a very expensive model. This is the mesh. And yeah, uh, we, we, we don't have the budget to run that many samples through it. So that is really like the objective or that was uh, one of the motivations of, of developing this um, thinning method in the first place. <clears throat> so uh, to sum up, uh, this is a relatively simple and flexible approach. Um, you can uh, set this up in uh, it's yeah the code the the um, the operations are really simple. It's it's easy to code. Um, we think there's applications in both multi-level MCMC MCMC um, multi-fidelity and also for surrogate models if you have a model if you want to train a surrogate model but you can't pick that many samples then it might also have some application there we've also developed this very fast approximate mmd uh, where you can choose between different kernels and you'll just have to draw your um, uh, projection 
your random projections from some different distributions to get different kernels. And plus with this genetic algorithm, we can actually get a population of near optimal solutions rather than just one. And some of the open questions is that it's not quite clear what dimension of this random feature space we need. Uh, I think it's very problem de dependent uh, because it depends how the, the samples are really distributed. Um, <clears throat> another thing is the genetic algorithm it works really well, but it is not the most rigorous approach. So yeah, um, I've been thinking about what kind of alternatives there that could be. Uh, plus, yeah, it was just like a, a thought I had like the other day that the samples are actually no longer random when we optimize it this way. And I'm not quite sure what kind of consequences that might have for let's say multi-level estimators. Yes, so that's it. Thank you.